Welcome to To The Point. Currently in the state legislature, there are a number of bills dealing with abortion and reproductive health stemming, Democrats say, from last year's passage of Prop 3. That ballot language was as follows. A proposal to amend the state constitution to establish new individual right to reproductive freedom, including right to make all decisions about pregnancy and abortion, allow state to regulate abortion in some cases, and forbid prosecution of individuals exercising established right. It passed by over 13 points. And to put that in perspective, nearly 50,000 more people voted for Prop 3 than voted for Governor Whitmer, who won by almost 11 points. Now that multi-bill package has moved out of committee and Democrats say it clears the way for Prop 3 to be implemented. This week in Grand Rapids at a roundtable event held by the governor, she made the case for the Reproductive Health Act, as it's called, by ending the session with this admonition. As the legislature continues their deliberations, um, your voices are really important, so I appreciate that and I appreciate you for hosting us. And um, please reach out to your legislator and <laughs> encourage them to get the RHA um, passed uh, this fall and, and um, we can live up to the spirit of what I think the voters expect us to as we saw overwhelmingly last November. In attendance, in addition to Senate Majority Leader Winnie Brinks, was our first guest, Walker Democratic State Representative Carol Glanville. Representative, you serve on the Health Policy Committee and that is a committee that has been looking at a package of bills, uh, the Reproductive Health Act mm -hmm. uh, collectively, and it's a, a number of bills. I don't want to categorize what they do. I want you to tell me what you think these bills would do and what's the purpose of, of dealing with these. Sure, so um, as you probably are aware, uh, we had a very popular um, proposition on the ballot uh, last fall, Prop 3. Um, to legalize abortion here in the state of Michigan um, to mandate that people would have access to reproductive health care. Um, and so these, this package of bills responds to that um, because currently, you know, you can say somebody has a right, but a right isn't a right unless you have access. And over the years, um, there have been a number of statutes put in place that create barriers to this type of health care. And so it's still, although it is part of our Constitution now, it is still difficult, if not impossible in some cases, to get reproductive health care, um, the full gamut of reproductive health care here in the state of Michigan. So we're looking to just remove some of those barriers and create a space so that folks can access the health care that they need. What, are the, what kind of barriers are there that prevent people, uh, prevent women from being able to access um, uh, abortion? One of, the, one of the ones that I think people hear the most about is the 24-hour waiting period. And while it might sound innocuous, uh, there's a couple of things of note there. First of all, there's no other health care that requires a 24-hour waiting period. I mean, you go to your doctor, you have the conversation, you understand what the situation is, and you decide how best to proceed, and you don't have to wait 24 hours to do that. Um, and so with that 24-hour waiting period, I think a lot of people don't realize how stringent that is. So you have to go online, you have to find the right form, it is time stamped, and if you show up at your doctor's office a minute early, <laughs> you, it, it doesn't count. Um, so many women are unaware of that or they have difficulty getting to the forms, it's a, you know, as things tend to be, it's confusing on the website, you know, all of these things. Um, so in addition to that, they are required to um, obtain or to, to, to get this packet of information and the packet of information is really around what your options are, adoption or, or other things. There are many, many patients who are not in a position, like they may not want to terminate their pregnancy. Their pregnancy may be terminated naturally and they need this health care to finish the termination and, and be able to produce, you know, to have children in the future. Um, and they are forced to sit through watching this information, reading through these pamphlets about you know, how they should be making another choice or what their other options might be when they are in the most extreme, you know, most difficult decision of their lives and difficult time of their lives. Imagine losing a child in utero and then having to, to go through this process of a 24-hour waiting period. So it can be um, detrimental in so many ways. And for women who have to travel a great distance, particularly folks in our rural communities or up in the UP where they can't get to a hospital that provides that care, 
it's even more onerous to have to go through this, to take the time off from work, to have to wait the 24 hours, or to have to reschedule your appointment if you didn't get the right, you know, didn't get the time stamp right, and your appointment, you know. So it's just, it's an unnecessary, and like I said, there's no other health care, you know, there's n nothing else we go to the doctor for where we're required to go through this. So if we're going to treat um, reproductive health care, like any other health care, it's just, you know, it just fits that, that same model, so. I know that you and the governor and many others who support these bills have referred uh, to the proposal that was passed in the last election cycle, and it did pass mm -hmm. in, an, in an overwhelming fashion, mm -hmm. um, in very close proximity to the time that Roe was overturned, mm -hmm. uh, when the momentum for such activity on ballots across the country mm -hmm. <clears throat> was very high. And it passed, and there was no question about that. Yep. What some of your opponents have said, the people, not your opponents, sure. but the people who oppose this legislation, mm -hmm. <clears throat> is this goes well beyond the scope mm. of, of that uh, ballot initiative that was passed. And in fact, <clears throat> if this is what the ballot initiative was supposed to have addressed, it would have addressed. Mm. Is, is, there, is there any concern that this goes beyond or do you think this is just reflective of that proposition? I think it's reflective of the proposition as, as I said at the beginning you know you if you have a right to something it's not really a right if you can't access it and so not only the 24-hour waiting period but there are things where um, clinics are you know there's there are um, architectural guidelines and regulations around like the the size of the door opening so that it can um, you know, accommodate a, a gurney or a stretcher. So people don't seem to understand, like, these are not surgical centers, they are clinics. So if you think about it in terms of like a dermatologist, you go to the dermatologist, you have to have a little thing done, you know, you just do it right there in your doctor's office, you don't have to have the surgical regulations around that. And it's the same thing with reproductive health care. You don't, it's not a surgery, it's, it's a procedure, and so it's done in a clinic. And, um, but Again, these regulations that are in place treat this treatment different than any other clinic treatment. And so um, I don't, you know, these, this, these laws that we're trying to put into place or to overturn, they really are just answering the question of if reproductive health care is something that people across Michigan have the right to access, then we need to make sure they can access it and treat it like any other health care. I need not tell you that any time abortion reproductive health, mm -hmm. these issues come up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they become, for many people, very black and white. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't think of a more stark example than looking at this set of bills right now, mm -hmm. some of the conversation in committee, mm -hmm. and where I believe, and to be quite clear, I do not count every vote in the state house, mm -hmm. <clears throat> It occurs to me that right now, without bringing it up on the board, it looks like it would be 55-55, or pretty close to it. At least one Democrat has said, and it doesn't mean it's written in stone, that she will vote against this package or parts of this package. Mm -hmm. But as you well know, and as we've talked about before, you've got to have 56 every time you put a bill up, or you have to have Republicans. Mm -hmm. It is my thought, Again, I'm not <clears throat> speaking for you. It is my thought that that's not going to happen with mm -hmm. this set of bills. Mm -hmm. So how do you in the next four weeks um, proceed with this? It's already out of committee. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. ready to be voted on if yeah. the votes are there, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I hear what you're saying. And I appreciate that, you know, there are, you know, everybody has, many people have strong feelings around this particular topic. And I appreciate that and I respect that. Um, for my part, I was elected to represent people. And so my personal feelings about something like this, I mean, they always have a, you know, you can't completely separate yourself from that, but I really try to think about, you know, again, I'm a representative, I represent. And when a vast majority of people in the state of Michigan approve this, it is my job then to make sure that they can access their rights. In terms of the numbers, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit, Conf I don't know, I find it interesting that we, I mean, and I know this tends to be a, a partisan issue, right? 
But I find it interesting that folks on the other side of the aisle are being so stringent on this. Um, as an example, you know, we've had, I've had constituents in my district talk about, you know, um, husbands come to me and tell me, you know, that their, their wives, you know, they couldn't proceed, they couldn't proceed with another pregnancy because of some health complications, and if they were to get pregnant, their choice would be either mom dies and leaves the family and leaves the other kids motherless, or we need to terminate this pregnancy. And the, the fear and the, you know, the emotion around having to make that kind of decision or having that kind of decision in front of them. So, you know, a lot of times this just gets put into like it's a, a women's issue of some kind, but it is a family issue. It is a societal issue. And the other thing, um, you know, we had a very poignant floor speech today from one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in recognition of infant loss um, and the remembrance of, you know, and, and what it's like to go through a miscarriage or multiple miscarriages. And the kind of health care you need to support that is the same. And so if we're, we're forcing, can you imagine having a, a child die in utero and then you have to do this 24-hour waiting period and, and look at what your choices are? I mean, it just seems so draconian and unnecessary and, and it just, I, I, I have a hard time understanding where the empathy and sympathy and humanity is when we are creating these pathways that make it just so difficult to access the health care that a person may need. Democrats believe the bills that have moved out of committee dealing with abortion and reproductive health are just an extension of and a way to implement Prop 3. Republicans say it's nothing of the sort. That view next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. Norton Shore's Republican Representative Greg Van Workham, like Representative Glanville, serves on the Health Policy Committee. Unlike Glanville, Van Workham thinks those bills in the Reproductive Health Act are dangerous and outside the scope of Prop 3. Representative, let me talk to you about your position on health policy. Uh, it's one of the committees you serve on. And over the past few weeks, uh, you and your Democratic colleagues have been talking about, been discussing um, what are being labeled as Reproductive Health Act bills. I think there are 10 or 11 of them. Um, they have passed out of committee now. But give me your take on what these bills would do, what they propose to do um, as passed, what they would do if the House concurs and the Senate goes along with it. Yeah, I do serve on health policy. They did pass, unfortunately. Uh, I was in opposition because I think it's a misnomer of calling them the reproductive health uh, acts. Um, this is definitely going to set women's health backwards. Um, there's multiple bills, as you said, 11 or so, but these are things that are important, um, that protect women's health, that are going to be put away. There's things such as not allowing coercive um, uh, abortion. Right now, a doctor needs to ask, are you being forced to do this? It gets rid of that. This gets rid of uh, the partial birth abortion ban. Think of somebody in a third trimester. They will still be able to do an abortion and do a partial birth abortion, which I think is abhorrent. Um, there's multiple others um, that are, are very same. Um, there are the consent, informed consent. Think of any uh, operation that you may have, any visit to a doctor that you may have. You want to know what, this, what the potential ramifications are for, for this procedure. And one of the bills would uh, get rid of that. You won't have the 24-hour uh, waiting period and things like that. So it's multiple bills that I think are definitely going to put women's health at risk. When you were in committee and when you were listening to uh, the testimony, and I read some of the testimony, um, there was at least one doctor that said that because uh, certain information had to be passed along, it made it more difficult for, pe for women who were um, facing an abortion because perhaps there was uh, an anomaly with the child or, or something like that. Uh, do you think any of those things that are being uh, repealed or potentially repealed, because again, this has only gone through the committee stage, do you think any of those were burdensome on women who were looking for abortions or do you think it was necessary um, 
to have the information given to the people uh, who were seeking those abortions? I think when the voters passed um, the proposal to last year, um, what is now gone is far beyond what was put in there that women are allowed to have uh, an abortion. And this is another step in that direction. What this will do is a lot of what we do in the legislature and government is prevent bad actors from, from practicing. And I've got an article here, and I hate talking bad about my hometown of Muskegon, but you may recall back in 2012, they shut down an abortion clinic. You've got things on here of the police report, multiple unsanitary medical instruments, blood on the floor and walls in multiple locations, uncovered buckets containing unknown fluids located in the operating room. We want to stop that from happening. And these bills, I feel, are going to allow those bad actors to operate again. We want safe, sanitary conditions for these types of clinics. And when those doctors come up and testify about that, sure, they may have a, a, a clinic like that and operate in a sound way. But a lot of the things that have been put in place over the years is to prevent those types of bad actors from happening. And I'm afraid that these legislation is going to allow those bad actors to come back again. So we've already talked about a couple of times that these bills have already been passed out of committee. And what we have seen during the course of this legislative session is that Democrats have the votes to pass pretty much everything that they have wanted to, sometimes with little or no Republican support. I assume this would be one of those circumstances where Republicans will be uh, unanimous uh, in opposition from uh, the, the response that I've heard from people on your side of the aisle. So that leads to an interesting circumstance where at least one Democrat um, is showing opposition to this. And because the margins are so narrow, one Democrat defecting, if all the Republicans vote no, these would not advance. Is that realistic or is, is this something that Democrats are going to be able to, in these next, what, four weeks that you're going to be in session, are they going to be able to move these on the House floor? Well, we haven't seen them come up since uh, that committee vote, and I think it was a little bit surprised to the chair that one of their members voted against. Um, and there was a legitimate reason. She has concerns about taxpayer-funded funded abortion. Under these bills, under Medicaid, um, you and I, and certainly people that are opposed to abortion will be paying for people's abortions. And there's always been long standing of preventing that from happening. One of the bills here would allow that to happen. So it's a legitimate concern and share that concern uh, with her. From what we've heard, there could be several other Democrats that are opposed to these, whether they fix that issue or don't take that bill up. Uh, would be a, a question and just run the other 10 or something like that. Um, but right now, uh, we're hopeful that uh, Democrats will see kind of where this is going, how it's going to hurt women's health in the long run. There, there are a lot of different things that are going on in the legislature now, including a bunch of uh, energy bills uh, that we highlighted in the show last week that are somewhat questionable as to what's going to happen with them. What sense do you get, and I get it, as being in the minority, it's not like you get a lot of, of uh, warning about what's going to go on. But I am of the opinion from, again, just information I've been able to gather, bits and pieces, nobody has said this to me, that November 9th would be the latest that you guys would remain in session. Um, that means there are about 12 legislative days, not counting this one that will have passed by the time this airs. Um, to get things done. That's not a lot of time. I mean, it doesn't take long to run the bills. For example, in the House, those bills are teed up, ready to go if you have the votes. Uh, but if you, if you don't, it, it's possible that some of these things get held over. And I do that setup to say that we know that in November there will be an election in, I think, Westland and Warren, mm -hmm. where two Democratic House members have the possibility of becoming mayors of those two jurisdictions. If they do, at least for a period of time when you come back in 2024, the House would be 54-54, which means 
that these type of bills that have strong Republican opposition have no chance of passing. How much pressure does that put on Democrats to get those done right now? That is the, uh, the, the bar game of Lansing right now of when are we going to be uh, done in signing die, whether it's November 9 or earlier, and then the dynamics of whether these races pan out for uh, those candidates or not. Uh, there are some major bills um, that need to actually happen yet, um, but you're right, I am not in the, uh, the majority, I am in the minority. So there are things like um, the financial disclosure bills that uh, were passed by a referendum uh, last year that um, need to be put in place by, I think, January 1st. Um, there are some economic development bills that we hear are a priority uh, for the governor right now. Um, and then there's, there's these. I don't think these necessarily have a, a timeline that says these need to be done by, by this period or can then go over. But yeah, a lot of eyes in Lansing are looking at uh, the first Tuesday in November and what's going to happen with those mayoral race. And then what are the ramifications afterwards? That's split government of 54-54, or whether we actually show up, whether the speaker uh, has us come in until the uh, special elections are, are held, and what types of bills could be done in a 54-54 split. So, and what, what does the speakership look like in a 54-54 split? So it's, it's one of those uh, questions that gets talked a lot about uh, late at night here in Lansing. Well, it's, it would not be unprecedented because there was a time when the House was 55-55 and the speakership was actually shared between a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, I would suggest, my words not yours, that that is far less likely to happen in today's environment. But what has it been like for you as we wrap up this interview in this year? Because you have, uh, even before you arrived in the legislature, were exposed to it through your dad who served um, and has been largely a Republican majority for that entire time. This has been a very different animal. What's it been like for you going from the majority to the minority? Sure, um, it's been frustrating, uh, certainly. I have served or have been on staff with just about every dynamic, whether it's a Democrat, Republican, uh, head of the administration, Democrat, Republican, Senate, Democrat, Republican, House. So I've seen just about every iteration during my um, time working in politics. Having all three in uh, the Democrat hands uh, and being in the minority, it, it, it's very frustrating. It, it has been very frustrating for six months. I kind of took an approach where I'm going to focus on a couple of issues, uh, some district issues, but some issues out here and really focus on those and try and build some stakeholders um, and relationships and try and get those done. But it just becomes what you do with, with your time. My, uh, my meeting calendar is a little bit less. Uh, my uh, demands on my time is a little bit less of the meetings, but it's just been frustrated with the bills that uh, this majority has decided to, to go with um, as they're pretty counter to the philosophical and ideologies of uh, conservatism and, and where I stand. So, but I come up, get to Lansing every day and try and work on a couple issues and make sure I'm serving my constituents. Back with a final thought to the point. The House could take up the hotly contested bills we discussed at any time. We'll keep you updated every week to the point.